pleasure to introduce Lukas Pomorski, Head of ESG Research and Managing Director at AQR Capital Management. Over to you, Lukas. Thank you, Anna, and thank you very much for the kind invitation to speak at this fantastic conference. Um, so I will speak about uh, uh, ESG investing going beyond traditional uh, strategies. Um, I will show you very briefly the disclosures page and start really at a chart that I think we all know quite well by now. So this is the growth of AUM, just generally speaking, in uh, ESG labeled strategies. On the right hand side, you have month by month flows over the last couple of years into, again, ESG labeled strategies as uh, captured in the Morningstar database. We already know, and we certainly know from Laura's research, for example, that ESG is a big thing. It's a big thing in public equities. We heard some really interesting research that Laura has on uh, corporate bonds, for example. So that's already in place. Uh, I want to attract your attention to something you can barely see in the screen. At the very top of those bar charts, uh, you see a category called other. So other in particular includes uh, non-traditional alternative strategies. Now. There is a reason why this slice is so thin. That reason is that the overall community hasn't really gotten to these strategies quite yet. It's arguably, traditional strategies are much more important in terms of the overall AUM. They are perhaps easier to think in the context of ESG. But at the same time, that thin sliver you might barely see in the bar charts does not correspond to the importance of alternatives in investors' portfolios. So the good news is that nowadays there's actually a growing consensus that we cannot ignore alternatives any longer. This is something that is uh, a very active area of debate. There's a fair amount of controversy here, but I don't think there's many people out there who would argue that alternatives are out of scope for ESG or for ESG reporting and so on. So we'll talk a little bit more about this today over the next 20 or so minutes. I want to highlight that uh, there's a number of position papers that appeared in the last, you know, at least one year. So AMA actually published something on short selling a year ago. There's an interesting paper from the PRI that just appeared a few weeks ago. Uh, we have uh, not very many so far, but at least some asset owners, for example, Harvard Management, uh, speak out on the topic. This is also something that is very important uh, to many managers, and many of us are actually vocal about this. And yes, I am pasting in a snapshot from one of AQR's own papers on the far right. I do want to send a message that we care about the topic. I also want to claim it uh, that we actually were earlier than most. You know, the snapshot that you're showing, uh, that we're showing on the right, is actually something that we published back in 2018. And you know, if anything, we're a little bit ahead of the market. People were not yet ready to uh, talk about uh, alternatives quite yet. So. Why do we talk about alternatives today? And specifically, I will focus my comments on short selling and on climate investing. Well, there's three reasons why we believe that uh, shorting or alternatives generally have an important role to play in an allocator's portfolio, particularly for those allocators who actually care about ESG. Reason number one is simply alpha or returns. This is perhaps the most obvious one. What I mean by this is that uh, if you uh, look at the, your, your investment universe through the climate lens, then you may be able to find some issuers, some securities that may have a meaningful negative exposure to, let's say, climate, potentially sitting on stranded assets or whatever else. And if you believe that that information is not yet impounded in stock market prices, for example, then the right way, the most effective way to actually act on the information will not be to divest from the security, will be to potentially outright short that security. So that's perhaps the most straightforward argument. The argument in the middle is risk and hedging ESG risks more broadly or climate risks more specifically. So that's something that in my view at least is uh, the single most important argument, argument for alternative solutions in ESG. This is something that we already know from Laura's research, for example, is really important for investors hedging or, or at least managing uh, climate or, or ESG risks more broadly. We will we will hear from Rob Engel later on uh, today uh, talking about different ways to actually measure, capture these, uh, these risks. I will uh, st state that these risks are potentially material and unfortunately, you may not be able to avoid them in a traditional portfolio. So you could build a long-only 
equities portfolio or credit portfolio, for example. But that portfolio may be managed to reduce the exposure to climate risk versus the benchmark and may go a long way towards that objective. But at the end of the day, in my view, it's going to be extremely difficult, maybe impossible, to build a well-diversified, broad core allocation to an asset class in a long-only format without taking on at least some climate type risks. Shorting, alternative generally, shorting in particular, is, part is really attractive because you can actually remove all that risk. You can build portfolios that have zero risk exposure. What is most tantalizing to me, at least, is that you may be able to build portfolios that are outright hedges for this sort of risk exposure, meaning that you can build a, an alternative portfolio that is focused on climate that will be able to hedge out net, let's say, risk exposure to climate that you may have in another mandate in a different, in a different strategy altogether. There is actually something that uh, Rob uh, published on with an illustrious set of uh, co-authors, uh, including, I would say, uh, a colleague here at AQR, Brian Kelly, in a paper that they literally titled Hedging Climate Change News. And I will pause it, and uh, I think Rob would ag agree with me that uh, that type of hedging portfolios that they were constructing would have been outright impossible without shorting. So hedging is something that is really important. You know, we will hear more about climate type risks later on in this conference. But I want to state also the last and the most con controversial reason why shorting has a role. And that reason is impact. Impact in a sense of trying to influence real economy outcomes through your financial portfolio. Now, let's talk a little bit more about this because it is uh, somewhat difficult, it's somewhat uh, maybe counterintuitive. Hopefully, it won't be by the end of my, of my comments. But let me start with the most obvious statement of all. If you seek to influence what your portfolio companies do, for example, the single most important, most powerful way to, for you to seek impact is through a long position. Establish ownership in a company, vote the shares, you know, engage with a company, uh, potentially get a seat on a board. Anything else will be at best secondary or tertiary ways to seek impact. Now, in what, in my view, is a really poignant trade-off in ESG investing, most ESG portfolios will practically mechanically close down the most powerful avenue for impact. They will do so because they will simply not hold those securities, those issuers that are responsible for most of what the end investor actually cares about. At the bottom of a page, you can see an example for uh, climate specifically. And what we're doing here is we're showing you a, a, a hypothetical strategy, a strategy that uh, tries to minimize the tracking error versus the S&P 500 while targeting a very meaningful reduction in carbon emissions, 90% reduction versus the benchmark. Now, it shouldn't be surprising that this strategy mechanically simply will not a, will not afford to hold any of the meaningful emitters of CO2. You can see that I bucketed the stocks based on the CO2 emissions. This, this portfolio doesn't hold anything in the first, in the bottom 20% of stocks started on emissions. It holds just a sliver of this third decile, effectively robbing the investor from any sort of ability to vote or frankly engage also with the emitters who are responsible for the vast majority of the emissions in that, in that particular benchmark. To be clear, I believe that there is still some avenue for impact. It's going to be less powerful, but uh, divestment may drive changes in the cost of capital for the underlying issue issuer. So there is still some impact, which just isn't anywhere as great as it would be through voting engagement, etc. So that's long only. What changes if you are able to short? Well, so I'm overlaying, you know, the, the chart here with an example of a long short portfolio, but tries to replicate what that long only portfolio does. It's still uh, beta one, still seeks the broad market uh, exposure overall, still tries to minimize the tracking error versus the benchmark, and still targets a very substantial uh, reduction in CO2. Now, this portfolio, to be clear, will still not go long the most egregious emitters. It won't, by definition, it's trying to look at uh, to, to, to seek reduction in CO2. 
it might actually short those those companies. And uh, I don't want to get, get into this now, and, and, unless there is Q and A. But you know, but I would actually argue that if you compare divestment to shorting, shorting will give you a little bit more impact than divestment will. But again, it won't be as powerful as going long. The point that I want to make, and the point that is maybe a little bit nuanced, is that shorting is important for impact because it opens up, it gives you a budget to be able to establish more long positions in the companies that are emitting CO2, for example, or greenhouse gases more generally, than you would have been able to stomach in a long-only long setup. So why is this? Well, you can invest in some of those, maybe not the highest uh, emitters, but you know, medium to medium high emitters, because you're effectively hedging the risks, for example, climate risks, through a short positions in the heaviest emitters. So compared to a long only portfolio, you will be able to get at least some impact through your voting and engagement with at least some of the issuers that are doing most of the, uh, in this case, damage that you care, care most about, which, which, which would be greenhouse gas emissions. So we covered three reasons, alpha risk impact, why shorting may be of interest to, to allocators. In my last issue that I wanted to talk about, uh, we'll talk about reporting. Reporting is something that is mundane, that people makes people yawn usually, which I think is unfair to reporting and is particularly unfair to ESG reporting because this is a, uh, an area where there is a, uh, a lot of debate and frankly an area, area that is also rife uh, with controversy. So let's talk about reporting and uh, I want to make this point that it, this is a broader issue than just ESG labeled hedge funds, let's say. This is an issue that every single allocator who has any shorting in the, in the overall program will need to face. If you have a 130 strategy, whether ESG labeled or not, if you have a long short fund, whether ESG labeled or not, you need to make a decision on reporting. The decision could be you basically will declare this out of scope for reporting, which in my view would be a poor decision, but it is one decision. Then you might debate whether you should report longs only, whether you should report longs and shorts separately. Should you add them up? Should you take a ratio of them? Or, you know, eventually uh, what we believe makes more sense, should you net longs and shorts? So before before sort of declaring that this is the, 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 the right way to think about this, you know, let me take a step back and invite you to think, what are the, uh, the attributes, the characteristics of a reporting system that makes that make it work, that make it worthwhile? One of the key dimensions that I would highlight is that given a set of positions, given a line by line holdings in stock A, B, and C, et cetera, the reporting system should give you the same overall report for the same holdings, regardless of whether these holdings come from long only portfolios or a combination of long only long short. And just to illustrate what I mean by this, think about a, an actively managed long only ESG strategy. Now, that's standard. We are on sort of firm ground here. We have very clear, very explicit TCFD guidance. You know, for example, how to calculate the weighted average carbon intensity of that long only active equity portfolio. So we're fine. Now, an active portfolio is identical, is equivalent to a, a combination of two strategies, two mandates a passive mandate that only invests in the index, and then a hedge fund with longs and shorts that are identical to the overweights and underweights of the active mandate. This is kind of an extreme example, but what I'm trying to, the message I'm trying to channel here is that uh, there's many ways to arrive at a set of exposures, and some of these ways will actually include portfolios that are able to short. And I will posit that uh, ideally the reporting framework that an investor thinks about will arrive at the same conclusions at the same report given the same holdings regardless of whether these holdings are uh, are obtained through this combination or that combination of the underlying mandates and i will say that netting does that trick and unfortunately many other um, design choices that people have suggested you know, actually wouldn't preserve that continuity, would actually give you different numbers, different overall results, uh, depending on whether you look at long only mandates or long only and long short mandates, but again, arrive at the same holdings. 
finally, and this will, this will be my last comment, uh, the second argument uh, uh, for, for reporting and for considering net reporting is basically the adding up constraint or aggregating positions across investors. It's relevant because anytime you or I short, there is somebody on the other side of that transaction. So if you short, there's somebody out there who's actually buying that security. Now, if they're buying, you know, again, maybe they're buying for the purposes of a long-only program, they will report the carbon footprint, for example, of that security in their own report. The investor who you, or, or an allocator who you borrowed the security from to be able to short it, will also keep the security on the balance sheet and will also report for the carbon footprint of the portfolio. So if you if you were to ignore shorts altogether, you will basically overcount. You will double count the, uh, the, the lender of a security and of the, uh, your counterpart is somebody who's buying the, the security on the other side of your, of your short transaction. It's actually worse you know, if you think about the overall amount of carbon that this reporting system would tell you there is uh, out there, that number will actually uh, fluctuate randomly depending on how much shorting activity there is at a given point in time. And at any given point in time, that overall aggregate number would not agree, would not coincide with the actual emissions of, uh, of the actual portfolio company in the real economy. That, in my view, is a pretty bad feature of a, of a system. And you know, really, the only way that I can see to, to alleviate this issue, to ensure that the aggregate positions of financial market participants actually agree with the real economy emissions would be through the use of netting, would be to actually put that negative number on the short position. So as I, as I said before, this is still a really recent debate. This is something that, you know, that people are asking questions, are trying to investigate. Uh, I don't think that we can uh, declare that there is any one solution, netting or otherwise, that is winning the consensus today at least. But you know, it is something that is topical enough. And because of this, I, I thought it would be of interest to this, to this conference. My last slide here, and I won't bore you with rehashing everything that we covered, is the conclusions. I'll just tell you that uh, we covered different reasons why alternatives and shorting in particular could be a useful design choice for ESG-focused investors. And you know, maybe mundane, but I think really important, we also covered some issues with reporting and some frameworks about how to think about what a good reporting system would do. Thank you very much, Lucas, for this very insightful discussion. We have uh, received many interesting questions from the audience and we have some questions ourselves. So we quite liked your argument. Why divest, simply divest, when you can actually short, go one mile longer? But our students are asking, but if you are short, somebody has to lend you those shares. So somebody actually has to be long and um, if nobody wants to be long in the company, it's just the uh, shorting interest has to be so high that somebody would want to be long. And maybe that person doesn't care about ESG at all. So aren't you making it worse with your decision to short? Right. So uh, I don't think so. I, it, it's a good question, but, you know, but I, I think the argument actually goes uh, both for shorting and for going long. So if you think about that, so remove shorting altogether. You know, if think about the, uh, suppose that everybody's long only, maybe for shorting constraints, prohibitions. Well, in that case, the argument still goes through, but that becomes an argument against divestment, not against shorting. You know, eventually if you divest, well, you can only sell if there's somebody on the other side of your trade who's willing to purchase that security from you. And uh, arguably if more and more investors um, care about ESG and, you know, let's say divest from those poor ESG issuers, then the, by revealed preference, people who are willing to buy those securities will be less concerned about what whatever it is that, you know, that, uh, that cost your divestment in the first place. And I think it's the same actually with shorting. So um, the argument has to be a little bit broader than this. Again, without before we go to shorting, the argument has to be about what the consequences are for the underlying issuer. And to the extent that uh, divestment, for example, drives the price down, it's actually, ironically, it creates a better deal for your counterparty, for somebody who's willing to hold the nose to buy that security for buying it at a lower price, basically. So keeping cash flows constant, they can expect higher returns perhaps going forward. So 
what what you're doing is actually you're increasing the cost of capital to the issuer because the issuer who wants to issue new securities new new stocks new corporate bonds for example now knows that the prevailing price is much lower than it used to be making it more difficult to finance projects so i think through that channel actually divestment has a role to play and i would say but you know that by the same argument i would say that shorting could actually play a role in exactly the same context you still have the issue, but somebody out there is buying shares and that person, that institution person, whatever it is, may not care about, may not share your uh, ESG views, for example. But, the, but the, the channel of impact is, again, it cannot be voting because you're shorting or divesting. It has to be something else and the something else would be the cost of capital. Mm -hmm. So just following up on your answer about the cost of capital, how important do you think this channel of influence is on firms? Because many would make a point that, well, these oil and gas companies, they have so much internally generated cash, they don't need to go and raise further equity. Is this effective? What do you think? I, um... I, I will again say, state that you know that this is a second, maybe third order of importance. Uh, so directionally, it certainly is. It is clear to me which direction that argument goes. And depending who you ask, if you if you read some, uh, and I forget which bank it was, but somebody released some uh, analyses uh, a couple of weeks ago stating that the cost of capital of uh, fossil fuel heavy. Uh, issuers as a, and I, I forgot the numbers, but you know, it's we're talking multiple percentage points higher uh, cost of capital than uh, than for greener companies. So, and I, I would argue that part of it could be risk, for example. Maybe you want to get compensation for the risk that you take on if you buy by securities, but probably some of that is actually about the investment. Uh, your point about uh, needing to go to the market for new financing is is, is a great one. There's, uh, I'm, I'm always uh, very careful about uh, that impact on the cost of capital. I mean, if you're buying and sh selling shares in the secondary market, I think you have some impact, but you know, but uh, very few, well, many companies might go to the corporate bond market, for example, first, before they go to the equity market. Again, the ESG wave has already arrived at the corporate bond market, so maybe there won't be an easy arbitrage, perhaps. But uh, unless the company co comes back for new financing, it's going to be very difficult to get that impact through the secondary market, or at least more difficult than it would have been in the primary market. So, so my again, I would maybe sort of go back to my presentation. I would say that the single most important way to drive impact would be for the long position. It may force you to hold your nose for ethical reasons. It may force you to have a really tough conversation about risk. You take on risks if you hold these companies. And again, I would view some of the alternate solutions, shorting, but also other, uh, some derivatives, for example, you know, maybe a couple of allowances and so on, to allow you to, to give you a budget for going along some positions where you can at least remove some of the risk, ESG, climate risk, and so on, but still retain the right to vote uh, at the at the shareholder meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So Stephen Porter from Scottish Widows is asking the following question. How would this approach apply to fixed income portfolios? So I actually don't see much difference in a sense that I was trying to be very careful. If I said stocks a few times, I, I apologize. I should have said issuer. I should have said security. Uh, I think the argument still applies. And uh, to be very clear, I, I, I'm extremely comfortable making the argument in the context of corporate securities, corporate bonds. I think I think, I think it actually applies. Uh, what I haven't uh, thought through fully, and you know, there's an active debate within AQR uh, on, is uh, whether the same argument you know actually applies to sovereigns. You know, when you think about sovereign bonds, so. Stephen, with your with your permission, I won't comment on sovereigns quite yet. Maybe maybe it's it's one of the topics we'll we'll, we'll, we'll speak about in the future. But at least in the corporate securities, I think the argument goes uh, either way. I mean, if you if you think about my adding up slide, the last slide that I showed, uh, you can replace the carbon footprint with, for the purposes of a simple example. I, I simply looked at the what fraction of a market cap of the company you're holding. You know, making very public equity specific, you can replace this and ask the question, what, what fraction of the enterprise value of the company, including both equity and, and, and debt, uh, are you holding as an investor and you know, prorate the carbon footprint based on this? And so I, I do believe that, you know, that the arguments apply uh, on, on both sides, yeah. for, for, for both, uh, for both uh, equity and debt uh, financing. Thank you very much. So the next question is from Alberto Cicetto from Schroders. 
Can you provide a comment on whether and how ESG relates to factor investing? Oh, great. Uh, so thank you, Alberto. Great question. It's, uh, uh, you know, the answer will be disappointing. The answer is it depends. Uh, it's, it, it does depend on how you form your factors and actually how you define ESG. But I, I don't want to leave you with a boring answer. So I'll give you maybe a little bit more, uh, hopefully, insightful answer. Uh, if you look at the sort of on a factor by factor basis, uh, where you see uh, overlap, both because you may end up using the same information, but also because of correlations, but maybe just for other reasons, you will see some overlap between ESG and broadly speaking, quality or defensive styles. So it's going to be a poor man's ESG portfolio or poor woman's ESG portfolio. But if you sort stocks on, uh, on let's say, quality, you actually will recover at least partially the sort on, on ESG. If you use low beta, something, I, I don't believe low beta deserves to be called an ESG factor. But if you sort stocks on, on the beta, stocks with low beta will tend to have higher ESG uh, rankings, for example, as per a variety of third party vendors, you know, again, depending on what data you use, you know, but the, but the answer might be a little bit different. Uh, one factor that I'll mention where the uh, exposure might be actually negative is value. It's not a very strong negative correlation. We did a lot of work on this, actually. But if you, same idea, if you sort stocks on valuation ratios, uh, stocks that are high, good ESG stocks, you know, at least as per third party vendors, tend to be more expensive. They tend to be more expensive. And I actually view this as a, almost a validation of a whole sort of ESG investing um, uh, phenomenon because, and by the way, they have been more expensive for a while now. This is not a, a statement of the last couple of years. Uh, but to me, this is evidence that the market actually cares about ESG. The market is willing to put a higher valuation, a higher price on a company that everything is equal, has strong sort of ESG uh, components, strong ESG features. So, so in that sense, you know, there is a slight uh, headwind for value. I mean, if you, again, depending on the process, if you deploy value on a within industry basis, you actually alleviate some of the most obvious correlations, you know, energy is maybe a cheap sector. So if you allow value to get articulated across sectors, you probably would also end up with a portfolio that is very carbon heavy. So Back to my point, it depends. But at least for us, for AQR, what we notice is that there is a very sort of clear positive correlation with quality and low volatility, volatility factors. Uh, there is uh, not a strong, but a negative correlation with value. In a combo, in a multi-style portfolio, that correlation is basically zero. Thank you very much. And we have time for one last question. It comes from Lane uh, Prenevost from HSBC. Shorting is certainly an important portfolio management tool. Considering points around time horizon, especially where some of the ESG issue might be longer than the typical time horizon of shorting, plus some of the points around additionality in the overall narrative, is it really an ESG point or is shorting really an ESG point? Uh, so that's a great question. Again, again, the answer will be to some extent it depends because it does depend on the investment process. Uh, this is not about shorting as such. This is about the investment horizon. If you have a statistical arbitrage portfolio, then the long positions of its portfolio probably wouldn't have much relevance for ESG. I mean, you're tactically momentarily long a given company. You probably are not going to be long that company at the end of a day or at the end of a week. So, so, so your your point is extremely well taken. Horizon matters, and uh, there is a. I've I've encountered an argument that uh, that long in, the long investors uh, would have longer horizons than short investors. I'm not aware of any evidence to that extent. You know, there's there's plenty of long long only money or long money generally but that, that is actually very fast moving so i, I think uh, the question is really part of due diligence for a, for a manager i will give you the answer for aqr so i mean i know what these stats are for us uh, it's actually very similar for for the long and short uh, leg of our portfolios and uh, roughly speaking you know a typical sort of median short position is actually held for somewhere around 10 to 12 yeah, 10 to 12 months. So close to a year, uh, similarly to our typical long position, we have a non-trivial sort of minority of shorts, maybe a quarter of shorts where that horizon is going to be multi-year horizon of a short position. Whether that's enough, I think it depends. If your view is uh, towards, you know, climate and, you know, 
particular physical climate uh, risks, for example, that horizon of one year, or maybe even a couple of years might not be enough. But I think it's ample enough to actually capture a lot of ESG issues and certainly potential repricing of its risk on a going forward basis. Well, at this point, we've run out of time. So let me thank you very much, Lucas, for a great presentation. Um, really appreciate having you with us today.